Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on DC Emerging Technologies Munch and Learn series. So hope you all had your lunch or bring your own lunch. Uh, but wanted to give a little bit of overview about DC Emerging Technologies, what this community is about and why I started it. And now I'm joined by my amazing team, Ojuala and Lindsay, who helped me get these events up and running. Um, so DC Emerging Technologies started in 2016 with the goal of just building the community. It's a, just a meetup group. It's not a nonprofit or it's not a registered business. It's a meetup group to bring everybody together to discuss emerging trends in technology. I know myself uh, being in technology for over 22 years, I'm always looking for new ways to learn about new applications and <laughs> Since I am in the world of artificial intelligence, it's more imperative for me to keep abreast of these technologies. And I'm sure everybody in the audience and others, members of our group and community also feel the same. So we started hosting events in person in Washington, DC at various venues like uh, WeWork and uh, more recently we even had it at General Assembly. So essentially we are uh, me, we meet uh, every quarter um, before this lunch and learn series. Hopefully, we'll meet more often since it's. Um, but that is our goal. And if you all have any new ideas about events that we need to host online, send them my way, and I'm happy to organize something with experts in the industry. So today's event, I know we live in uncertain times and today's event will focus a little bit <coughs> on how artificial intelligence is being used um, to either triage or in the treatment or even to accelerate uh, the vaccines uh, of uh, treating COVID-19. I know artificial intelligence is not a one point solution. By itself, it's not going to solve the pandemic. What it is used for is to accelerate uh, in various aspects of dealing with the pand pandemic. And so today I'm very grateful to Dr. Ingrid, who is joining us from Miami, Florida, uh, to answer some of our questions. Uh, and uh, those of you in the audience, feel free to interrupt us and uh, uh, pose any questions that you have, because this is a short meeting. So I'll hand over to Dr. Ingrid for her introduction, and then uh, I'll do a short introduction of myself and we will kick it off. Sure. Hi Ingrid, welcome to our event. Uh, mm -hmm. Of yourself would be great. Nice to meet everybody. I think you might want to mute uh, the rest of the attendees because I see a lot of background. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Thank you everybody for attending. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time. Um, my current role is Chief Quality and Innovation Officer uh, for a company where I have the opportunity to interact with uh, healthcare systems across the United States. And then I'm also involved in multiple international projects and that allows me to, to meet people all over the world, of course, who are involved in technology and who care like us on uh, about, of course, how we can tackle this pandemic. So. Lately, we were talking with, with Swati how many uh, news uh, channels you have that feed everybody quite a lot of information. And a lot of our colleagues feel confused sometimes or not sure what to believe and what's fact versus what's in development and what is really possible now versus just the scientific endeavor that we hope to achieve several years. So we thought it would be nice to put a short uh, meeting together where we can emphasize what is being done now concretely every day uh, to help patients that are currently dealing with COVID and help hospital systems that need to address this pandemic and then also to maybe clarify what can we do for the future to prevent this kind of situation to, to happen again and we'll hope to, to address some of those uh, questions for you if, if you think that it would be valuable. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Ingrid. A very quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm Swati Young, Chief Technology Officer of Integrity Management Services, a healthcare company with uh, uh, federal contracting services predominantly. Um, I'm also wearer of multiple hats, like I like to say. 
Uh, I started DC Emerging Technologies, and then I also am a Women in AI ambassador. Women in AI is an international nonprofit uh, whose goal is to increase diversity in the world of artificial intelligence. Um, I also recently co-authored the AI Playbook for the federal agencies, which is a framework of how to implement AI solutions for federal agencies in DC. Um, so that is uh, in brief. And like uh, those of you who came in late, I am the organizer of this meetup group. And if you have any cool ideas you want to discuss, send them my way. And I'll make sure I get an esteemed guest, just like Dr. Ingrid, for a good conversation. So uh, starting right off the bat, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, um, Ingrid, about how are doctors currently using artificial intelligence? There's, like you said, there's a lot of misinformation, like even is AI even helping? So can you throw some light on that question? Sure. So first, I think it's good to clarify when we say AI, uh, there are various uh, technologies that fall into the AI family. So every time we're mentioning something today, I'm going to specify which one. So predictive analytics is, of course, the one that most people are most familiar with. And having the tools available with them in the emergency room or on the floor where they're treating patients has helped some of them be able to prioritize which patients need help faster, meaning who needs to be on a ventilator or who doesn't who would need certain types of medications faster versus later on in the course of treatment, who would not benefit from a specific type of treatment, and then who is more vulnerable to develop multiple complications or atypical presentations, because I think that has been a, a very common trait. So most of the time what you've seen in the media, predictive analytics has been probably the most frequent tool within the AI family that has been deployed in emergency rooms, on the, in the critical care units around the world. And then I would categorize it still on three levels. One is imaging, so predictive analytics and, and um, algorithms that try to understand how to diagnose COVID faster when you have an image. And you will have hospitals around the world that are using CT scans or x-rays, depending on the availability, because sometimes not everybody can have a CT scan. There was just not enough time or not enough resource available. So some countries have actually developed pretty good algorithms, even just from x-rays. So I would have one bucket, imaging. The second one has been lab work and blood results that would indicate to physicians, again, by using predictive analytics and algorithms to aid them to indicate which patients would have certain markers in the bloodstream that could help physicians guide treatment towards one style or another. And this is why you see, if you see the social media, every day you find another medication that someone says it's working or not working. So what they understood now is that not everybody will respond to all the medications. Not everybody will, will uh, tolerate all the medications. And this is where, of course, having predictive analytics tools to aid the physicians at the bedside to make these decisions will help. And I'm careful when I say aid, because you never want to think that the algorithm can make a decision for the patient. So it always, I think I like to specify that when we say AI, it should be augmented intelligence when we talk about healthcare. To augment the physician's reasoning and ability to serve the patient faster in whatever they're aiming to achieve. So we talked about imaging, blood work, the third type is medication types as well. The machine learning algorithms that were developed, and here I would say it was a combination of predictive analytics and algorithms. They were able to, to look through the whole research available for 50 years and to try to identify novel medications mm -hmm. that are traditionally used in other illnesses that have been able to help patients now. Because the challenge is there were no approved medications yet in the world for this specific disease because it just emerged. So again, the advantage of having an AI tool available to physicians was that they could quickly understand, okay, the algorithm proposes five new medications. Let's see if we safely test them in patients today, mm -hmm. how are they reacting? So those I would say are the big domains, imaging, blood work, medications that they can use at the bedside today. No, you touched all the salient points and uh, a good point to emphasize here is 
there are various uh, applications of artificial intelligence and in this context and most common usages predictive analytics and machine learning algorithms when we talk about ai in an industrial sense and not about robotics which is another subset of ai another good point i wanted to bring forth is that too often people think oh does that mean in the future ai is replacing doctors because that's the common question you get asked is ai going to replace humans and you made an interesting point there. You said it's augmented intelligence, which is so important to make the difference because it's not going to replace doctors, at least not in the next 20, 30 years that we can think about, but it, it will help doctors to make better diagnosis or more accurate. Imagine it's like two heads put together instead of one, right? Um, so a good example is in the case of COVID, uh, suppose uh, somebody is looking at an x-ray of lungs that have been affected by COVID. Obviously, we know that uh, one of the symptoms is it does affect respiratory, um, your lungs and other respiratory organs. Instead of one person looking at that uh, x-ray, it is being helped by the artificial intelligence as well. So it is two heads thinking of instead of one, one is a doctor and one is your AI. That's how AI is helping in increase the accuracy of your diagnosis of the results and even accelerate and make the process faster. So it's indirectly aiding in resolving the situation. I think the last point you made, I just want to echo. Uh, so a lot of the algorithms developed and, and there are several countries that have brought forth completely novel methods. So, so some groups in Israel, some groups in, in uh, the United States have developed completely novel ways, but where the algorithm was able to differentiate itself is the speed at how fast it could detect before the symptoms were severe in the patients. It could detect already things on a, on a scan to prevent the patient to end up so severe by the time we could diagnose it. So, Yes, accuracy is important, as you mentioned, but even more importantly, to detect it early so that we mm -hmm. hopefully can prevent the patient from experiencing severe symptoms. That's the goal for them, if they can. No, that's a good point. Um, so moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit, bit about everybody from students to uh, people that I meet on the road when I go for a walk are talking about flattening the curve. Yeah. And we know that's a very specific terminology in statistics, which is the foundation of machine learning algorithms. So how is AI used in these predictive models that, that say, okay, have we achieved the curve, uh, the flat curve, uh, so that decision makers, whether it is politicians or lawmakers, even at the federal, state, and county levels, can decide when it is safe to reopen. So how is AI used in in uh, determining when the curve is going to be flattened. So that's a very important point. And every day I, I actually am very passionate about this topic because I think unfortunately the media is not always portraying it accurately. And even some scientific venues are, uh, sadly don't always emphasize to everybody what that graph actually represents. So to try to boil it down very simple and, and in a few minutes, any machine learning algorithm can only do what a human told it to do. It cannot do something that it invents right now when we're talking about flattening the curve. So it will try to simulate what happens to a specific number of populations in a specific number of days or minutes or hours or years. And then it has to have parameters that we give it to calculate all that. Those mm -hmm. parameters are essential and unfortunately not only machine learning, but statistics are essential here. Because if the denominator, and it gets a little technical, but if the population that, the, that uh, is being analyzed by the algorithm is the whole world, it means one thing. If it means the city of Miami, it means another thing. If it means right. Italy, right, it will show very different. So when we talk about flattening the curve, you need to ask a few questions first. Who decides to give the algorithm the parameters? What are we trying to understand and over what period? Because mm -hmm. it's all relative. Now, if you count over 100 years, yeah, we will flatten the curve, definitely. If you count over one day, we will not flatten the curve no matter what you do. So time sequence is crucial. And when you look at a lot of social media, when they show the graphs that they compare, 
they're not comparing apples to apples. Mm -hmm. So one brief sentence would be to say that, uh, that uh, definitely if you look at the statistical analysis, you cannot make that determination to say have we flattened the curve or not. What's really important is to understand the denominator of the population and what are you trying to understand in the numerator, meaning what population are we considering? Are we considering um, the population that could have been prevented from being infected? Are we trying to prevent everybody from being infected? Or are we trying to model, if we assume that everybody would be infected no matter what without any type of intervention, what would happen? So it matters how you choose the parameters before you can answer if you flatten the curve because it's relative compared to what. So if you look Sweden, they did no precautions whatsoever. So if you would model United States or uh, let's say Singapore compared to Sweden, it would look very different. But if you didn't give the same parameters to the algorithm, you can't compare. So to answer it, and I know this got a little technical, but to answer it, the machine can calculate pretty much anything, but it matters what we're trying to compare it with and what our goal is. If we say we had done nothing, zero, no social distancing, we just assumed that the natural course would happen. How would it would have looked like? It means one thing because the algorithm will take just normal numbers of the population into consideration and assign certain levels. But if you compare with, well, if we had done it earlier one week versus two weeks later or three weeks later that we implemented measures and you compare, well, how would the curve look like in that scenario versus one week later or two weeks later, then it starts to be different. So long story short, flattening the curve is a very subjective way of showing things, but it's an objective methodology. And unfortunately, many people have portrayed it in a way that has confused the audience. So, no, that is, that's a good point because I was looking into the models that was uh, presented by President Trump a few weeks ago and I was like, what is the source of these models? Because as, a, as an AI expert, those are interesting to me. So I saw the source was the um, Seattle Institute of Research and uh, they have uh, traditional statistical modeling, I think. They have not published their methodologies, but yeah. It's, it's a very, very good point to note. Too often we hear a lot of statistics in the news. What is the average salary of an American? They say $40,000 based on what? If you are like a, a nerd, you will dig into, okay, how did they come up that $40,000 per year is average American salary, right? And then we have to look into uh, they, they took the mean and median of both the extreme salaries and came with the number and there's all this statistical modeling. I think the same goes through with flattening the curve. It is very important to know where are we talking, what population are we looking at? Is it at the county level or a state level or a country level? Because you can get as granular as you want and then over how long, like you said, if you look over one year, it will become flat at some point, most probably if we have a vaccine. But if you're looking at shorter intervals, which is very important right now, because we have to make a decision when businesses can open. And all that is relying on this flattening the curve, the modeling. And that's where I think AI is very useful uh, given uh, a person who is an expert is feeding those parameters that you're talking about. Yes. Very good. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, Ingrid, uh, so, so therefore, um, would you see that, that modeling something like COVID uh, would be more like a hidden Markov model in that you have the, the emissions being, you know, unfortunately people who die, but since there's so much subjectivity into the classification, Aren't we really trying to, you know, work this, you know? Uh... The, the correct way would be to compare, which is impossible in a pandemic. That's the problem. The correct way would be to compare. So Sweden did not do anything. And you would compare in another pandemic, if they had done something, how would the curves look like? But you can't. So unfortunately, we compare apples and oranges right now between countries because each country did another measure. So we're trying to simulate against hypothetical 
models. And unfortunately, as you saw, they can be wrong. The same way like we tried to simulate hurricane paths, right? It can deviate that it hits half of the continent or not. And the same way here, if you give the statistical model a specific amount of power and parameters, it will assume a certain amount of infection rate, right, amongst people. But that infection rate is controlled with what we do as a population and what we <laughs> decide to control. So think about just the measures we took. For many weeks, many countries did not recommend doing any measures, right? Or who says that six feet is enough? Do we have any valid measure to show that everybody kept six feet? No. So the modeling can only be as good as, as we give it data, unfortunately. So in a true scientific rigorous manner, we would have to compare the same exact situation now with a hypothetical in the future and that's impossible in a pandemic. So the rigor, we are, the, the rigor, the scientific rigor we apply in normal scientific inquiry cannot apply in a pandemic because you don't have time, unfortunately. So therefore you have models that have different degrees of, of infection based on just statistical um, inference that we assume X percent of people would be infected versus Y percent versus Z percent. And that's why the models in countries differ so much, right? And, and to peak, oh, it happened a week earlier. <laughs> well, a week matters because in a week out of 7 billion people, you have a very big difference in the numerator, right? No, good question, Stephen. Thanks for that. Uh, moving on, I want to understand a little bit about, I know um, every day we have newer libraries coming up in the world of machine learning and AI. Um, how can we use AI going forward? I know there are a lot of stories or even um, actual scientists saying this is the start of many pandemics that might come. Um, so how can AI help either to predict or prevent another pandemic in the future? Correct. So I think this is the part I always say, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, it's just super realistic that this is our pilot test, this pandemic, and truly the benefits for AI uh, are for people to understand what works and what doesn't work in this pandemic. But yes, if we deploy all the armamentarium that we have in the AI portfolio for the future, then we'll do better. And specifically, there are four areas that I like to emphasize. One is Having AI algorithms scroll through all our research, that's impossible for human mankind to do even for, if all of us scientists were for the next hundred years, manually we would never be able to do that. Number two, we're biased. We can only do it if we think about something to look for it versus AI algorithms. That's fact, it was published that within two days, an AI algorithm could already find five medication targets just based on their molecular structure and give them as potential opportunity for scientists to test them already. So imagine that would have taken us several hundred years to go through everything that was ever published in the history of mankind in terms of molecular ingredients for a medication. And the AI algorithm was able in two days to scroll through everything that was ever published and find five candidates. And now a lot of those candidates are being already tested. So that's one big advantage for the future. If we do that routinely, then we can prevent future pandemics because we'll always have a, a pool of potential medications available and handy that we can test based on the molecular structure that fits these pathogens, the bugs, so to speak, the germs. Versus now we're always surprised and we have to waste months in a row of trying to figure it out. The only part I would say it's really important if we do that to continue to break the silos. For this pandemic now, everybody broke silos that traditionally have impeded AI sharing of data and AI ability of algorithms to access the whole global database. If we don't work together as a global scientific community, no AI algorithm can show its full power. You need access to everything at all times. The identified, that's fine. But that's the only way AI, from a scientific perspective, to have access to the database can propose candidates for treatment. And same thing, candidates for prevention. And also identify who would be more vulnerable. And that's mm -hmm. the part where genomics comes into play. So AI algorithms can also scroll the same way like they scroll to medications or, or uh, other molecules that are good for vaccines. They can look at genomic indicators or markers of severity. Meaning if I have something in my blood that's a marker, an AI algorithm can say, 
ah, the population that has these three markers is more vulnerable to develop severe disease, or a population that has these markers is more vulnerable to, to have the pulmonary form versus the stroke form versus the blood clotting form. And same thing for future pandemics, having all these AI tools available, specifically machine learning, deep learning, and having access to large sets of databases without any bias is what can help future pandemics and make us manage them better, even if we can't prevent them. That is wonderful. Um, I know we're almost up to time. We wanted to keep it short. So I'm going to open the floor to the audience for any questions um, in the next couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Just, just a comment that, um, you know, we, we have our uh, AI group out of Bethesda that includes a lot of NIH researchers and others. And um, <clears throat> we're also using uh, natural language processing to parse all those papers as you were talking about. That's great. That's so helpful too, super helpful. And through physician notes and, and many other documentations, yes. That's the only amazing. other part I, I get a lot and we didn't get a chance to talk too much, but it's the same concept is vaccines and antibodies like testing for, for any pathogen. So that's the same concept though that we talked about. Accuracy and time matters a lot in developing vaccines and machine algorithms can help us because the data changes so quick. So COVID has already mutated 6,000 times just since the first genetic makeup we had. So when you do a vaccine, it takes several months to test it and to see it's effective. Imagine by the time you develop that vaccine, it mutated already several thousand times. So that vaccine will only cover the first genetic makeup, so to speak. So that's a, the, the benefit of having a machine algorithm constantly monitoring and constantly adjusting to these new data inputs. We alone cannot do that without a, the computing power and the statistical power of, of an AI armamentarium. We can tell it, so yes, as scientists, we can give it the right parameters and decide which mm -hmm. ones are variables that matter. But I think that's the key that is so frustrating. I get that question every day. How come we can't have a vaccine? How come we can't have still a test that detects it? And I answer the same thing. It's not like we don't have tools. We do. But the, the virus has mutated so many times that by the time you develop a test, unfortunately, it's not as reliable. So. Very good. Uh, and Stephen, thanks for letting me know. Maybe we can collaborate on doing an event together. Yeah. So more to come. We'll uh, keep in touch. Uh, anyone else? Any questions, comments, feedback? Okay, then. I know this is a short uh, session. It's just a test series. Uh, uh, more to come, like I mentioned, most probably look out for an email for an event next Wednesday at the same time and going forward and hopefully uh, we'll bring the short Munch and Learn series uh, that is effective and uh, is informational to everybody. So thank you everyone. Stay safe and uh, we will talk more soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks thank again, thank Dr. You. Ingrid. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone.